Hello there. Welcome back. We are now moving on to the next step, which is the truths of adaptation, according to Linda Hutchin. So we typically think of adaptations as a product, right? A thing that we read or watch. But Hutchin wants us to think of it as both a product and a process. Every adaptation requires interpretation. Every adaptation requires interpretation. That's the process, right? Somebody has to interpret the original, decide what are the essential elements that they're going to keep, and how to present those essential elements in the new medium. Maybe it's the same medium, but in whatever new form, they have to decide how, how are they, what are they going to keep and what are they not going to keep, what's going to change. And according to Hutchin, Adaptation then is, quote, a double process of interpreting and then creating something new. So it's a double process of interpreting the original and then creating something new. So that's the process of adaptation. And then the something new that you've created is the product. Betcha they took a famous book and made a bunch of different choices. Adaptation, new creation by their own hands. I could not have sung it better myself, Ariel. Because adaptations are both a process and a product, that means there are three characteristics of adaptation that result. And Hutchin discusses those on pages seven through nine. The first one she points out is that adaptation is, quote, an acknowledged transposition of a recognizable work or other works. In other words, it's not plagiarism. It's, a, it's an acknowledged transposing or transposition. So it's an overt reference to another text. It signals to the audience that it is an adaptation, maybe by calling itself the same name as Little Mermaid does, or by replicating the story like Ponyo does, or by naming Ponyo Brunhild, which is her actual name in the story. And that's a Dutch or German name that harkens, harkens back to the original origins of Little Mermaid as a Dutch fairy tale. So it acknowledges in some way the origin. I know that there was a lot of uproar about Avatar having used or being a rehash of Pocahontas. And I think that part of what the uproar maybe really was about was less that it was a rehash because we, we do rehashes all the time. We do adaptations all the time. And more that it was an unacknowledged adaptation or rehash. So I think the acknowledgement is kind of important. Next truth. Adaptations, quote, are always a creative and an interpretive act of appropriation slash salvaging. So what does that mean, appropriation and salvaging? I think we understand that they're a creative and interpretive act. We talked about that in the terms of the process. But what is appropriation and salvaging? And then I made a little video about it, which I will play for you now. The final truth about adaptation is, quote, adaptation is an extended intertextual engagement with the adapted work. So, that Intertextuality is the relationship that all texts have with one another because they all draw from the same pool of language and literary tropes. But this is a more specific intertextuality based on how the adaptation handles the various elements of the original. Hutchin specifically says that the intertextuality between an, an original and its adaptation is palimpsestuous. Woo, that's a tough word to say. Palim palimpsestuous. Palimpsestuous. So a palimpset is a text that's written on top of another text. So back in ancient and medieval Europe, Writing materials were so scarce that people recycled them by writing over them, sometimes in the other direction. So you might have a page face one way and then you turn it and write on it in the other direction. 
In this sense, one text is literally written over another. So you see a, a trace of the other text behind the first text. And this is the idea that Hutchin is invoking. She, she is suggesting that the echo or the trace of the original is always there behind the adaptation. We're always watching the adaptation with the original in mind. Unless, of course, we haven't seen or read the original or know about the original, and then we're not. Then it doesn't become pal palimpsestuous to us. Then it just is a, a text. Maybe it's the original. Like if you saw Little Mermaid first, then that's maybe the original to which you're comparing Anderson's and Ponyo's. It depends on the order in which you are exposed to that. When we watch a film then like Ponyo, after having read Anderson's Little Mermaid and watching Disney's Little Mermaid, both of those texts then are behind our watching of Panya. We're seeing all three at once, so to speak. This is how adaptation works. I wanna know what, what the students know. Ask my questions and get some answers. How does knowing help me? What's the word? Learn. That's a good question, Ariel. Knowing this kind of stuff about adaptation can help us understand why we like them so much or why we don't like them. And more importantly, it can help us understand how changing a story, even a little bit, changes the message. That's what we're always interested in literary analysis in the humanities. We're interested in what's the message? So how do the changes that happen in the process of adapting one text to another affect the meaning of that new text? How does it change what the meaning was of the original? What's the new meaning? That's really interesting. So in the last video for this lesson, then, we're going to be discussing the various strategies that adapters use, specifically moving from written adaptations to visual ones. Stay tuned. Is palimpsest...